tonight, Thursday night, January 2022. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for investing your time with us on this Thursday evening. My name is Maria Fuertes, and I am the director of the Practice Heroes Program at CareStack. We are happy for you to take part in our seventh series of Dinner with the Practice Heroes. Yes, you're here at the right place, hanging out with us tonight with the Practice Heroes. Your cameras and microphones are turned off purposely. You can enter your questions and comments into the chat box below. So don't forget to stick with us towards the end for information on how you can get your $25 Grubhub because guess what? Dinner's on us. So our goal tonight is that you will come away with an understanding, knowledge, and pearls of wisdom, if you will, that you can apply to be more successful in your business in the day-to-day, -day, right? So our audience tonight, guess what? You guys are the heroes of your practice, and we're here to help you in your day-to-day, -day, giving you that support and the resource. So here's a format to give you an idea what to, to expect tonight. We'll take a few moments for our lovely panelists to briefly introduce themselves and tell a little bit more about their background in the industry. I'll kick off the conversation by highlighting to the, uh, today's topics. And towards the end, we'll open up for questions, which you can enter into the chat box below. And don't forget then, to stick with us with the 25, you know, for that $25 Grubhub, because dinner's on us. Sounds good? Great, let's get started with the introductions. On tonight's Dinner with the Practice Heroes, we have amazing guests joining us tonight. Alicia Gerard, who provides consulting services, focusing on billing and AR, and I know that she also was a practice manager who was using CareStack. We also have a powerhouse, Billy DeMarco, our very own. <laughs> I know, Billy, you're nervous, but guess what? You're gonna go and be a rock star. And um, who literally, by the way, has a great story, who was born into the dental industry. I'll let her tell you, tell you all about that. Um, and also we have Christy Chavaria, who manages a large practice that's surgery, surgery focused day in, day out. All they do is surgeries all day, day in, day out. And guess what? There's a lot of stuff that, that needs to be talked about with respect to how to keep your insurance aging organized so that you can go ahead and collect from the insurance companies on a timely basis. As you can see, our speakers are passionate about insurance billing and they will be sharing their tips and wisdom with you. So with further ado, I would like to introduce our speakers. Can I go to the next slide? Yes, thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I will go ahead and start. Um, thank you so much for having me, Maria. We have so many nuggets of wisdom to share and I am very excited. So for everyone watching, I'm Alicia Gerard. I'm located just outside Salt Lake City, Utah. 11 years ago, I started my dental career as a dental assistant, dabbled a little bit in front desk, and then I went on to become a practice manager. I have been a user of CareStack for two years, and I am very passionate about revenue cycle management. I also currently assist multiple practices with their revenue cycle management, from performing basic insurance verifications all the way to performing account audits and collaborating with the doctors and their team on best practices goal setting and how to obtain those goals. I love being in the trenches of insurance as well as patient aging. So the whole RCM process just fascinates me and it pushes me to continually learn and grow. That's why I love it. Very nice, Alicia. Hi, I'm Billy DeMarco. Um, as I was so pumped up by Miss Maria, I do have a little interesting story about how I entered dentistry. Um, I have been in the dental industry for 30 years, and I have actually grown up in dentistry. My dad is a dentist. My mom's a hygienist. So guess who always got called in when uh, someone would get called out sick? Yes, that was me. <laughs> um, so I've been in dentistry full time since I was 16, um, where I started in the back um, learning a dental assistant on the job training dental assistant best way, by the way. Um, and I also was in the front as needed. As I went away to school, I said, I am not going to do anything to do with dentistry. I'm done. That's it. Joke, I guess, was on me because here I am 30 plus years later back in dentistry. Because um, over the years, the next 19 years, 
I grew into management roles in the dentistry field where I managed multi-group practices as well as private practices. And I have been with CareStack for a little over a year now where I manage the revenue cycles for multiple dental practices across the country. That's it for me. And I'm That's glad to be here, so thank you. Once again, you were, you were birthed into the dental industry. Yes, yes. I tried to leave it, but again, joke was on yeah, me. I know. <laughs> right. <laughs> Okay, so I guess it's my turn, right? Yes, Christy. Hi, everyone. I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Maria, for having me. Uh, my name is Christy Cheveria. I have been in the dental field about 27 years. Uh, I started off as a dental assistant, a registered dental assistant, and moved up through the office. I worked the front desk, did treatment coordinating, uh, and worked in specialty treatment coordinating, specialty assisting. <laughs> I also did insurance billing. Um, AR, and then finally took on the practice management role. So I managed a large group practice in Southern California for about 15 years. Um, we had specialty in the office as well. And now I'm in the Buffalo area managing a large private practice where we specialize with uh, IV cases. And I've been doing the Practice Heroes program for about eight months now. And I'm really glad to be here. Right. Well, it's great to have you ladies on tonight. And I know that we are gonna be talking about something that's very important, talked about all the time, seems like people can't just seem to get it at times, you know, with these insurance companies. Everything's always changing each year, every year. So, you know, I, I've got the, the experts here along with me tonight to help hopefully give you some words of wisdom and guidance, if you will and um, share with share those topics, excuse me, share those wisdoms with you so that you can actually implement it to your practice every day, each day, starting tomorrow. So here we go. All right, so topics tonight, why do we wanna keep a lean insurance a AR? One of the things that I've done in my career as an operator is that the first thing that I do when I come into a practice or to an organization, I always run an aging report, an AR report, if you will. And I'm gonna tell you, insurance billing, people that work in that department, I'm gonna use that old adage of, you are what I call the canary in the coal mine. I know that sounds very morbid, but at the end of the day, I always run the aging report because that tells me where there are busts in the system, right? And so, as being a canary in a coal mine, you're able to tell your organization, your manager, your doctor, it's taken this long enough time and getting paid by um, an insurance carrier, if you will, or why is it that I always um, get denials? Why is it that they're always holding back payment for, from, uh, for us? So once again, being in the insurance coordinator role, or if you're overseeing that part of the organization, it's a really important position. I can't, I can't stress that enough. Okay. So we're going to talk about how to keep your insurance aging reports lean. The ladies are going to talk about how to stay organized, verifying benefits. Nobody likes to do it. Everybody wants to automate it, you know, back and forth, back and forth. <laughs> and, you know, at the end of the day, you got to verify those benefits and you got to go deep down detailed if mm -hmm. you need to, right? So that guess what? Your aging report can be nice and clean transparency when it comes to presenting treatment to the patient. You know, it's all about the patient experience. What are the pre-processes for insurance aging? And then of course, there's the post-processes for insurance aging. It's a huge deal. This is a big thing. We, our doctors produce, our hygiene, hy, hygienists produce, and guess what? We got to collect. And so we're going to teach you how to get there. All right. So take it away, ladies. So Maria, um, one thing that we wanted to really talk about was avoiding potential problems that come with large insurance AR. So if you have a large insurance AR, just like Maria said, you are not going to be able to collect on that money because you're going to have all this money to go after. And there's only so many hours in a day where you can actually spend time collecting that. And you're wasting your time if you don't nip it in the butt in the beginning. Um, of course, our number one goal, which we'll talk about more in detail later, is to submit a clean claim. And submitting a clean claim means that what we expect 
goes straight out to the insurance. And within a couple of weeks, they send the payment right back to us. It's even Stevens. We're not wasting time sending in appeals. We're not wasting time collecting extra money that they were supposed to give us. And we're not wasting time collecting from the patient. Um, and then as far as consequences of a short insurance AR, Billy, could you touch on that? Yes, um, you definitely want to make sure that your AR is checked up upon often. We go through it and we have what we call a cadence or a protocol systems in place. Um, as we go through our presentation later, um, we'll get into the processes to keeping those, those cadences, those schedules on point which will help keep those ARs on point on top of things so that we're not sitting here having claims aging 120 days. Ideally, it would be nice to not even let your claims age 90 days. And the key to that is staying on top of it and, and just keeping on point. It sounds like there's going to be a lot of heavy lifting in the beginning, right? In the front end? In the front end, but once you get that, once you get those systems in the place, it's, it's going to run smooth. Okay, so we are going to kick it off with tips for staying organized. Um, this is what I suggest that everybody does. To keep yourself and your office organized, I recommend creating a document that has all the insurance information in it. So have the list of insurances that you see, whether you're in network or out of network, what fee schedule is utilized, and any insurance website login information and contact information such as the phone number, claims address, payer ID, and so on. And then just a note, if you do have multiple doctors or locations, you may need a separate tab for each one of these, depending on if their network status differs from the other providers or the locations. So is this something that you've done, created yourself, Alicia? This is exactly, this is a, half real, half fake snippet. I just changed the username and passwords to fake ones, but all the other information on here is actually real. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, it's this, the, because of the fact that you're having to take care of appeals and grievances, but sounds like, again, I'm going to keep saying this, there's a lot of heavy lifting in the front end. Here's another example is obviously getting yourself organized is part of that, right? Exactly. Well, and this list is also helpful because say you hire a new staff member and mm -hmm. Don't you love it when somebody calls them and they're like, do you take so-and-so insurance? And they are looking at you and they're like, do we take Aetna? <laughs> <laughs> we that is there's the list. <laughs> <laughs> there's the list. Okay. Yeah. We can move on to the next slide. <laughs> right. Having it handy is very important. And the yeah. thing is yeah. though, your team should be informed and educated because the last thing you want is to have your patients think that you don't know what you're talking about or they don't know what they're doing over there, right? So being informed, yeah. educated, and informing your team members where to find that, um, that insurance information, website, you name it, obviously will keep people organized and have it handy. Sounds like being yeah. becoming more efficient, right? Yep, exactly. This is network versus insurance company. Yes, so this is not something that I feel like is talked about a lot. So I just kind of wanted to touch on it because it does affect... Um, your aging because it affects how you put your insurance into the system. But um, when you ask an insurance company, what fee schedule does this plan use? What you're really asking is what network is this plan with? So there are a different, a couple different types of networks. There's insurance company networks, umbrella networks, and then networks only. So an insurance network example would be like Aetna, they provide the benefits. They also have their own network or their own fee schedule, which is Aetna PPO. An umbrella network is where if you're out of network with a particular insurance company who does happen to have their own network, but they utilize an umbrella network, that then makes you an in-network provider with their plan. So for example, you may not be directly contracted with MetLife, but they may pay you based off of Connection Dental because you're in contract with Connection Dental. So Connection Dental is that umbrella network. Um, and then lastly, there are a few network only networks. They don't provide any benefits as an insurance company. They just supply the network or the fee schedule. So examples of that would be like Dentamax or Carrington. So I want to ask you a question. Somebody yeah. who's new into the dental field, perhaps, right? Because everybody is shorthanded nowadays. So you're going to train them on, on insurance and 
you know, is there something that they need to do when they call the insurance company? Is that in a contract that, that you get that tells you you're, this is the network versus the insurance company? I mean, where do they get that information? So whenever I am calling and whenever I train someone to call and verify benefits, you always ask, what fee schedule is this plan? What, you know, what fee schedule does this plan use? That's how you know what network that plan is under. Because the fee schedule is just another name for network. Now, Alicia, playing devil's advocate, because you know I like to do that. Um, sometimes what the operators like to do is they like to tell our team, um, they like to flip that question around and ask us before we ask them, oh, is your doctor in network or out of network? And what is your advice on handling that? So never answer that question. Um, always just say, can I provide you my tax ID and you can look that up for me? Very good. <laughs> yeah, they have that capability. Uh, that's right. So Maria, actually, that that is what will help the office in the end determine whether or not what which one of those networks they belong to. Although, like, like Alicia was saying, they may not belong to MetLife, but MetLife may belong to one of those umbrella fee schedules to where they do belong to that. So asking that what fee schedule do, do does this plan follow is extremely important. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. All right, so verifying benefits. Right, so that brings that brings us into one of the most important parts because this is where you start to build your relationship with the patient. So we all know that the key members in our, in our team is who they talk to first. So our front desk really needs to be strong and needs to be good communicators and hear the question behind the question, which lies there in the deep a lot of the time. Um, so when a patient calls, a lot of times they're gonna say exactly what Alicia said, what insurances do you take? And we're, for the most part, we say, oh, we take all PPO plans. So that's kind of another thing of one of those umbrella statements. So your patient's on the other end and what do they hear? They're hearing, okay, great, I have dental PPO, Delta PPO, so you're in network with that. However, what your patient truly just asked you is, do you belong to my Delta Dental PPO plan? Mm -hmm. Because I know that with that plan, I get my cleaning covered at 100%. So gathering that information correct right from the beginning is going to build that relationship and start your relationship off on a positive foot with confidence right off the get-go with the patient. So that brings us into our next pointers. What is the five key things that you need to obtain from any patient giving you insurance? You need the insurance name after, you know, I guess before that, let me, let me backtrack a minute because there is another caveat to that. Most of our patients, when they hear, oh, what is your dental insurance? What card do they 90% of the time have in their hand? usually have their medical card. <laughs> they Definitely. usually do. 90% of the time, it's their medical card. So it is okay to ask them, go through these five things, their insurance name, their patient name, and date of birth, subscriber name, date of birth, subscriber ID, and social, and the phone number. But definitely don't be afraid if during that conversation, something tells you, mm, that might be their medical plan. Ask them, does the card you're looking at say dental, dental, male dental claims to or for dental information? That'll tell you right away whether or not the information you just gathered from them is correct. It'll let them know that you're paying attention to the information that you've gathered and also that you care to get it right the first time. Those are actually very important because one of the things that I've always have have um, seen time and time again, when I'm looking at aging reports, when I tell you about like, what do I look for first? Well, when there are claims that are denied because it's missing information, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're sending it back to you. And you know, it takes more days and weeks to then collect that payment from the insurance company. Mm -hmm. And then one thing that you said is like, you know, describe to me what that card looks like in your hand. I remember I had a practice in Southern California where they, because we took HMO and also PPO only because of the the, um, you know, the, the, the town or the city that we lived in, right. There were huge employer groups. So we would ask the, the, the patient, does your, does your card, does the Delta looks green or is the Delta look blue? Cause then we'll know, is it an HMO plan? Is it a PPO plan? If it's, if it's, if it's 
a dental plan. That's a very great point. So yes, definitely. If you know what those cards should look like to differentiate between the plans, definitely ask those questions. Thank you, Maria. That's a really good point. Sure. This is my favorite part, exclusions and limitations. <laughs> okay, so we're going to... I be mis made mistakes as well in this, okay? So... <laughs> and every, it is. It's a very... <laughs> It's a basic one, but it's really important. So the, the exclusion limitations are really important when you're verifying benefits because this is going to affect your AR. So some of the basics that you're going to ask, and you definitely want to make sure that this is on your whatever you're using to verify benefits, whether you're looking visually, you know, on the computer or you have a sheet that you're filling out. It's really important to have these in there. So you're asking these important questions. So you're gonna have di diagnostic and preventative limitations. That's gonna um, include, you know, how often exams and cleanings are covered, x-rays, all of that. Your downgrades, whether they're gonna downgrade on fillings or uh, crowns. Missing tooth clauses, those are really important. You wanna find out if the insurance company is going to cover, you know, a prior extraction. Uh, waiting periods, waiting periods. We have waiting periods now on fillings, excuse me, we have waiting periods on fillings crowns, um, you know, there's all kinds of sealants, all kinds of things. Um, replacement frequencies, that can vary a lot nowadays. It can go anywhere from five years to over 10 years. So these are really important questions because all of this is going to, you know, affect your AR in the long run if, if claims are being denied or things aren't getting paid for. And also if you're a specialty practice, you definitely want to make sure you're asking those specific questions how things are covered. So you wanna make sure you have some solutions for this. You know, we wanna make sure there's some processes in place so that things aren't getting denied. Because if you're not gathering this information thoroughly and quoting the patient off of those frequencies and limitations, then patient's gonna end up with a balance and they're gonna get a statement 30 days or 45 days later, and that's when they're gonna get upset about it. So that's why they're so important. And it's gonna help develop trust, obviously, between the office and the patient. Um, you know, the patients, they expect us to know their insurance benefits. They think that we're the experts, you know, so we need to be the experts. So the exclusions and limitations are huge when it comes to your AR because it will affect it. And, you know, if you're, if you're checking those exclusions, then that way, if you know something isn't going to be covered, if a crown is not going to be covered because of, you know, a time period or an exam is not going to be covered, you can obviously let the patient know up front and collect that money when they're, you know, prior rather than sending them a bill after the fact. So that's why the limitations and exclusions are so important and affect your AR, so. Right, good points there, Christine. Okay, so because this is a CareStack webinar, we are going to talk a little bit about how CareStack handles this. So some offers do allow you to input limitations and exclusions. Of course, CareStack is one of those softwares. So you can put in your basic frequency limitations, such as such and such code is covered twice in a calendar year or once every six months. You can also add limitations and exclusions like molars only on a sealant or 2740 specifically downgrades to 2792 or 4355, the full mouth debridement can't be performed in conjunction with exams. Um, inputting these exclusions and limitations creates more accurate treatment estimates, which in turn will positively affect your insurance AR. And then also that after that, your patient AR, when you put in an insurance payment and the insurance pays exactly what you expected, which by the way, it's such a beautiful feeling. Um, yes. <laughs> no time has been wasted on inputting adjustments or chasing down the patient on additional balances, um, or appeals and whatnot. So um, you may be thinking, why in the world are we talking about exclusions and limitations in a webinar that's about insurance AR? Well, the insurance AR starts with accurate estimates, which cannot be given unless you know your exclusions and limitations with your most common codes you submit. And part of submitting a clean claim means that what you estimate is what the insurance actually really does pay. So the other part of a clean claim is all the information that you have gathered is submitted to the insurance one time, and you don't have to submit any additional information or jump through hoops of appeals. So we're going to think of this whole part that we've already talked about so far. This is the pre-process for insurance aging. Um, a short insurance AR is all about preparation. 
So um, Billy's going to now go a little bit more in depth about how to submit a clean claim, what that looks like. Yes, once thank you, Alicia. Absolutely. Again, go ahead, Maria. Again, I'm sorry. It's, it's once again, it's heavy lifting in the in the front end, right? I mean, there's a there's a lot of work to do so that you can have this efficiency and be able to collect, you know, timely. It is absolutely, and once once that system is in place and that insurance breakdown format is established and you've gotten the flow, this is easy. This is easy. Mm -hmm. However obtaining it accurately is going to be your key because it is going to flow right into where we go next, which is when the patient is in the chair. When the patient is in the chair and doctors diagnosing and going over all the important stuff, and then our dental assistant comes in and, and gives the dental assistant or front desk, gives the estimate. It is extremely, extremely important that all that information on the front end was given. Now we're to the part to where we actually did the work and we have to submit the claim. This is the part that if we got all of the information correct on the front end, this end is a breeze. So we all know that we have to do attachments. And we know for the most part, um, most major and perio is what needs the attachments the most. Um, but it also starts in that complete exam and that exam with the doctor. Like was stated before, we need to know about the patient's prior history. We need to know lim those limit for the limitation clauses that Alicia was talking about earlier as well. How long was that crown done? If you didn't do it, ask the patient, when was it done? And more importantly, when that conversation happens, it has to make the chart note. Why does it have to make the chart note? It has to make the chart note so that when that front desk team member goes to make the claim, they can have a clean narrative. They can go right into the chart, know what you said, know the reason why, and put it in there. X-rays, bite wings are great, right? Great, but not great when we're doing treatment. PAs are what we need. We need clean paint. PAs that show the full apex of the tooth, like this one right here. If we took a bite wing, it wouldn't have mattered whether or not we said that it was a root canal tooth, a failing root canal tooth, or an open margin. It would not have mattered. Why? Because it didn't show that there was a huge abscess at the root of the tooth. You could have said it, but the, the team on the other end couldn't see it. Perio charting, again, if your system has the ability to show the um, bleeding points as well as reception, use it. Utilize all the tools that your software offers. It will help you when it comes to submitting your clean, your clean claims. Again, prior placements and treatment dates of all work that you might be replacing or redoing is also going to come into play when we're talking about um, moving an insurance claim through quickly. On our next slide, I have an example of what a clean narrative would look like. So normally what we may do or what we have done in the past, we'd say two and three have large restorations with recurrent decay. And some of us may, may jazz that up and say fa failing restorations, whatever that may look like. But all you're describing is the fact that you did cr a crown and why. What we're seeing is a lot of insurance companies are looking to deny the buildup. So why not go that extra mile, fill them with so, so much information, they don't even wanna read it because that box is full. Tell them that once you remove that, that existing restoration, not only did you see fractures, 50% of the tooth structure remained needing, resulting in the need for that buildup to restore stability and function. So we know as a team, after that, what would we do? We need to include our x-ray. We need to include our intraoral photo. Great, but what tells that person on the other end at the insurance company that that's there? They're not gonna look for it. So let's put it in our narrative, show it in there. Say, hey, I included the, the x-ray and the photo. Look for it and then process my claim. What that is going to do is that's going to trigger them to look for your NEA attachment instead of just saying, oh, they didn't mention it, so I'm going to assume it's not there and not even look. I'm going to put that claim over here on hold, and I'm going to send them a letter that says, I didn't receive the x-ray. And then what are you going to do? You're going to call, and you're going to say, hey, I got this NEA attachment. 
here's the number and they're going to go, oh, yeah, and it magically appears, right? <laughs> or you're not even going to do that. You're just going to answer that letter, staple a photo of the x-ray to it and mail it which is what they want you to do. Why? Because it wastes more time <laughs> and it ages that claim and you're not getting your money. And what happens in the meantime? You have placed that crown, patient's done. They think they don't have any more to do with it. Claim comes back two months later because we didn't send all the info and now your estimate was off. Why was your estimate off? Maybe they want an x-ray of the uh, proof of the buildup, by the way, insurance companies are asking for that now. Little tidbit, start taking x-rays of your finished buildup. Insurance mm -hmm. companies are asking for it. Mm -hmm. so, no, great tip. Thank you. Yes. Exactly. And they are also asking for x-rays, believe it or not, of your anterior fillings. Don't only take x-rays of your anterior fillings, take intraoral photos. If they don't ask, great. If they do ask, bam, you've got it. Instead of the, oh my God, what do you mean they're asking? I, I, that's not normal protocol. Make it normal protocol. Include it, fill them, be done with it. You're being proactive in this case, exactly. right? Exactly, yep. exactly. Yep. Okay, so I think we're gonna talk about out of network benefits now. So not everyone experience out of, experiences out of network benefits because most of us are in network. That's usually the norm. But I personally have experience out of network benefits. Um, so there's lots of things that you want to watch out for and be knowledgeable. And like you're saying, Maria, proactive. So with out of network benefits, some of the issues you can run into is you're not really sure if they're going to pay off of your UCR, excuse me, your UCR or their actual contracted rate. So you always have to ask that question. Um, as far as maximums, percentages, and deductibles, that can change when you're out of network. For instance, if you're out of network, preventative might only be covered at 80% versus 100%. And that was actually news to me because I was so used to being in network. It was just the norm. And so that was really surprising to me. And the maximums can change. They may not pay as much if you're out of network. Um, patients, once another thing, the biggest thing is you want to make sure because patients will actually get the checks for those payments. Mm. So that's something that you really need to be aware of. You can ask the questions, but I know on the next slide, we're going to talk about some of the solutions to deal with this. So the solutions when you're working with out of network benefits, again, when you're verifying the benefits, you always want to ask if the insurance pays off of UCR or the contracted rate. Sometimes you might want to actually give them an ADA code. You can ask it on a specific code. That way they can actually let you know what their UCR is because sometimes their UCR is going to be different from the office's usual and customary. That's, so that's, that's an important question. question. Yeah, that's a good tip because a lot of people will always say like, I, I wouldn't know what that is. And they take an adjustment, obviously in the back end, right? But it's exactly. the thing is that you share that procedure code with them. Right, exactly. And then you never want to accept assignment of benefits again. But like I said, you want to, if the patient's, is gonna be getting the check, then you wanna have some type of process in place. And obviously that would be, you know, the doctor's decision most likely to decide if you're gonna collect everything up front. That would be the best case scenario. Not every office, you know, is gonna be able to do that. Their patients may not be used to it. And if you're transitioning into being out of network. So I know that there's some tricks that are helpful. I know Billy, you're gonna talk about that being more, a little bit more aggressive when you're estimating the percentages. Yes, um, I, I work with a few clients that are in that situation. Um, you know, it's, it's sometimes they don't want to collect from that patient rate up front because the patient has insurance and it's just something they're not ready for. But what you can do is it's all about the way that you word it with the patient. As long as you let them know, hey, if you get a check, that means I didn't. So please let me know because you're gonna end up getting the whole bill. So if you bring me in that check and that EOB, it's a lot easier for me to know what I'm working with and make those adjustments if for any reason your office chooses to do that. I can make adjustments along the way. I know that some practices that I work with where they're out of network, they do choose to take the insurance benefits for preventative services. Um, another practice actually gives a discount off the front end. And what I mean by that, a discount in the insurance estimating. So 
we know traditional insurance is preventative 100%, basic 80%, and major 50%. What this particular practice chooses to do is to take 30% off each one of those. So they're mm -hmm. plugging in the insurance, and instead of preventative at 100%, they're putting it in at 70% and 50% or, and so on and so forth. So that with their UCR fees, it's getting those estimated out of pockets a little bit closer um, and, and sometimes, sometimes on preventative dead on um, so that the patient out of pocket isn't nearly as much as what it would have been. This does two things. This is keeping it honest with the patient so that they don't feel that your fees are ridiculous instead of really realizing that the insurance's expected fees are, are the ones that are ridiculous. <laughs> and they also look at it as, wow, you know, he was really honest with me up front. Um, it makes that those times when you actually have to send the bill, it hits a little bit softer. Yeah, it, it, it does. And if you've over collected, hey, isn't it better that you have your patient's money because you're going to give it back rather than the opposite and you're chasing them down for your money? Right, right. Those are great tips. And, and mm -hmm. in the office I'm in, like I said, Maria, with the out of network benefits, once we became aware of the whole process and how it works, because we do have a provider who's seeing some out of network, I just let the patients know that they're going to get the check because we don't necessarily collect it all up front. And I let them know, and it's a much easier process when they, when they're aware, you know, we can give them an envelope, then they can just mail us the check. You know, it's that simple. So usually like you're saying, Billy, if you make them aware, then it's mm -hmm. not going to hit as hard when you try and send them a statement, you know, even if it's for a little amount, they still get you know, they're not happy about it, obviously. No, so. no. But hey, I, I'm always happy when you call me and say, hey, guess what? They paid more than I expected. You have a credit rather than yes. the opposite. I, I'm kind of <laughs> not so happy with you when you say I owe you. I'd rather you owe me. <laughs> <laughs> right. so we got this option four. Yeah. Option four is we can utilize what's called fee registers in CareStack. Um, so a fee register is a really neat function. Um, they're really useful if you're out of network with an insurance and the insurance pays based off their contracted fees rather than the office UCR fees. So for example, if your UCR fee for an exam is hundred bucks, the insurance contracted fee is 70. The insurance will not pay you hundred percent of your UCR fee, the hundred. Instead, they're gonna pay hundred percent of the 70, which means the patient's gonna have a balance of $30. So with the UC or with the um, uh, fee register, you have the option to put in, the insurance is only gonna pay 70, but I'm charging a hundred. And the system's gonna know patients got a $30 coinsurance. So it just kind of helps bridge that gap. Um, we are now going to talk about some post processes. So we're, we're going to get into the nitty gritty, nitty gritty details of actual insurance aging. Um, so no matter what software you have, there's always an insurance aging report. Some are easier to work than others. And here, I just have a couple of quick examples of what an aging report looks like in a legacy software. So here's one example of a legacy software. You can go to the next slide, Maria. Here's another example of what one looks like in a legacy software. Um, but since most of us here are current CareStack users, we're going to show you how it looks and how to work it in CareStack. So I'm going to let Billy take that away. <laughs> Thank you, Felicia. So yes, um, being that I've, I've worked with a lot of different softwares, um, for me, I really like the way that CareStack does it. It allows you to isolate a lot of information. And what I mean by that is, here you'll see in our in CareStack, you're able to, it's still called aging, just like every other software, but I'm able to choose my location. I'm able to narrow it down by 30, 60, 90, 120. And I'm also able to isolate it if I have multiple practices. I could put it in by one practice and then isolate it by producers in that practice. Or I could see my whole group as a whole depending on how I choose to isolate that out. In this instance, um, you'll always get a summary page. 
The beautiful part about CareStack is when you get your summary page, it kind of looks like, oh, this doesn't really tell you much, right? It's great to know all of this, and but I need to know who's in these. Everywhere right. that you see blue, if you touch on the blue, it will, you can go to the next slide. It'll actually itemize every patient that is in that said category that you chose. So if that category was Dr. Smith and you isolated it out to be all of Dr. Smith's crowns that are still outstanding, or you want to know how many are over 120 days, you can isolate that out with CareStax insurance aging. Another way that you can view it is my personal favorite in the actual live env environment. You can go into the live environment and you can filter out your current from your aging. You can filter out based on claim flags. Um, claim flags meaning which ones need office attention? Which ones may have been sitting? What are my ortho claims? Because we all know we have to work ortho a little bit differently than we need to work our standard aging. So we can pull those out and really get into the nitty gritty in real time with this in the live environment. I don't have to print a report, go to another screen. I can go to all my screens and revert back and forth right from this one report. I can get into my patient account. I can see my claim. I can make notes. I can send it. I think what's good to point out here too is respect to the aging bucket. Now, mm -hmm. you know, managing multiple practices myself, you know, I, I had the, um, the benefit of having an RCM team, a revenue cycle management team, if you will. And I had, a, you know, a couple of my team members that would actually tackle the zero to 30 days because we know most of the times that if you had set it up that all the claims are being sent out clean, right? You got the narratives and everything like that. Most of these insurances will pay you within two to three weeks. Yes. Now we already know because we've seen it, right? You've seen the cadence. And so I would have a couple of my t uh, team members would work the zero to 30 and 31 to 60. You know, we don't want to have a lot of that stuff go past the 60 to 90 days, if you will. And then I would have, you know, my more um, seasoned, you know, aggressive, if you will, <laughs> um, detailed uh, insurance biller, financial coordinators, if you, you know, whatever the title is, I always, I, you know, they're the ones that are getting into those insurance companies and they don't like, they know what to say, <laughs> what, what to, not to get them to not get the, let them off the hook, if you will. Right. 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 So again, being proactive, having those narratives, do the heavy lifting in the beginning, you can easily then make this a, an aging report that's going to be lean and you're not going to see those buckets of, of insurance um, pending payments, if you will, age out, right? That's, we right. don't want to go there. Right, exactly. <laughs> what you want to see in, in your 90 days is if you're an ortho office, you're, you're, unfortunately, you're not going to avoid aging that way. However, there, with CareStack, you're able to label them that way so that you're able to track them. You're able to still touch them every month to make sure that qu or quarterly, whatever that looks like in your cadence, um, to make sure that everything is on track and that they're not missing anything. And of course, um, your primary, secondary, um, you can filter those through and make sure that they never hit your 120 because if we're sending those clean claims right from the beginning, your even your secondary should never go past 90. Right. Okay. So I'm just going to interject a couple of uh, claim aging tips. Um, so number one, if you have a MetLife claim in your aging report, and if your list isn't super huge, like maybe if you're a slightly smaller office, or if you want to just look at the zero to 30 or just the 30 to 60, gather all the MetLife aging claims. And then one phone call to MetLife or one online portal login, follow up on all those claims. Um, we all know how fun it is to stay on hold with an insurance company mm -hmm. when we have better things to do. So that's just a little tip to help minimize the excessive wait times. Uh, tip number two, a claim should be worked no less than every 15 days. If you followed up on a claim, for example, on January 1st, you need to follow up again on that exact claim no later than January 15th and then January 30th and so on. So most offices do aging once a month, but if you want to nip this in the butt, if you want your list, your AR list to be a lot shorter, we recommend that it's best practice to start aging on the first, work through all of the aging, and then start over no later than the 15th. So 15 days later. Um, tip number three. And there's some that are, there are some that are aggressive as well. 
right? Yeah. Then, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I have a couple of insurances too, where, um, because of COVID, I know their processing is taking longer. So I don't even bother calling them until maybe it has been 30 days. So just, just as you notice things. Um, but, uh, number three is actually about noticing something. So if you notice an insurance is regularly denying a code for a particular reason, adjust your pre-processes and procedures to avoid that. So, um, I noticed that, I randomly started having dental select asking for anterior PAs on incisal fillings. I'm like, what? You can't even see that much really in an x-ray. So we started taking intraoral pictures and an anterior PA on any incisal fillings. Never had an issue since. Um, Great tip. Just mm. when, you're, when you're putting in payments and you notice things, adjust your processes. Um, and then as far as this credit balance report. So... Um, a credit balance report is all about allocating funds. So make sure that you're allocating the patient funds to the proper patient and the proper codes. CareSAC does have this neat feature where you can batch post any unapplied credits, which is payments that haven't been allocated anywhere to codes that have balances. Um, and you can also pull the list and just do them individually if you wanna make sure they're getting allocated properly. Um, but it is best practice to apply advanced payments immediately upon code completion. So you don't have unallocated funds sitting on the account or a payment that's been allocated to maybe the wrong family member or the wrong date of service. Um, the well, Alicia, from a posting standpoint too, it yeah. will make the posting job that much smoother too when you're posting and everything zeroes out because the patient portion matches the EOB and in turn match the prepaid amount. So there's nothing dangling out there. Yeah, exactly. Um, I am going to give a, a little scenario on allocation. So let's say a wife comes in for a $500 treatment. Um, she prepays and the money doesn't get allocated immediately. Then weeks down the road, someone allocates that balance to her husband who happened to have a $500 balance because his insurance underpaid on something previous. So um, you've wasted time on insurance adjustments from the husband's claim. You're now chasing down the wife to pay her bill. The wife calls you and gets upset because she already paid you. Mm -hmm. And now you're having to spend additional time auditing the account to figure out where things got allocated improperly. So you can paint the full picture, not only for yourself, but for the patient. So you've wasted time. You've dealt with that patient and you potentially lost the trust of the wife. So had you allocated that um, advance payment upon code completion, you would have never run into that. So um, that's why I really like the, the care stack features of the credit balance report, um, as well as the batch posting and the whole unallocated and allocated payments feature. So insurance AR um, has much more to do with than with just running the report and working it in a timely manner. There's a lot of pre-process items that affect it, such as what we discussed today, um, obtaining benefits, frequencies, limitations, exclusions, entering them into your software, knowing the network that each insurance is a part of, calculating the benefits for out of network with one of the four options we talked about, um, and then allocating the funds properly and submitting that clean claim with all the good attachments. So your aging report, it tells a story like Maria said in the very beginning, your aging report is a direct representation of if you're doing these things correctly or how detail intensive you're being or not being. So if you want a low insurance and patient AR, you need to implement those ideas that we've talked about because it's going to save you a lot of time in the long run and it's going to make your life a lot easier. Um, I kind of like to say just like oral health is all about being preventative, you know, doing your checkups by yearly brushing your teeth, doing your fluoride treatments. The same goes for insurance AR. You're going to be successful if you've done all the preventative measures in the beginning. That's right. Well, ladies, I, I, I'm just blown away. Just a lot of information here. I think that you guys did such a great job. We also want to share our team, you know, kind of put our heads together. Like what are resources there that's, 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 um, that you can actually obtain um, now, if you'd like, I mean, I gotta tell you, I swear by the coding with confidence. I still have mine here. So look at this. Check that out. <laughs> I even like when I knew new doctors, I, I had them actually read the book, you know, 
And then also we've got the Understanding Dental Insurance by Dr. Travis Campbell. You can, you can find that in Amazon. Dr. Charles Blair, you can find at, at Practice Boosters. Also Moving Patient to Yes, look at I have her book too. Teresa Duncan's, you know, these are great tools to have and, and have it on hand. Um, that Coding for Confidence, you were talking about narratives. They got narratives galore. They'll tell you what to use, what not to use, what you're gonna have denied and what you're gonna get paid and, and uh, paid on the claim far quicker. Um, than you'd expect. So we wanted to share these, those resources for you. And like you said, Maria, getting with the coding, it's crucial. You know, if you get those doctors involved and they understand about the coding and what's necessary to get a crown paid because a lot of them get paid on collections. So it's, it's good to get them involved too, like you said. Yes. All right, before we open up to questions, we got the best practices and takeaways because I know we're running out of time here but I wanted to make sure that we, we get those questions answered. So our first point, our the first takeaway is going to be, again, the insurance verification, how important it is. I think the best way to describe it is being proactive. So you want to be as thorough as possible, you know, have everything laid out so you know exactly what questions to ask or what information to get offline so that then, you know, you're obviously going to have better quotes for the patients and they're not going to end up with a statement in the end. Absolutely. Always submit a clean claim, just as it says fill them with information, look at that claim and ask yourself, what could that, that auditor possibly need to put them in the state of mind that they are inside this patient's mouth right now? Make those narratives as detailed as possible, send those x-rays and those photos that tell the story that your words cannot. And definitely tell the history. If you don't know the history, get with your patient and know the history of where that mouth has been before that claim leaves, leaves your office. It will come back to you with a check in two weeks, I promise you. Yes. Um, it will, it will. Continually work your aging report. If you finish it before the 15th, great. Send your statements early and start reworking those claims. Make little notes. If the insurance tells you the claim is going to be ready in seven days, call them, make a note to yourself and call that one claim back in seven days. Utilize what Alicia said and get those websites going. A lot of your claim information is on those websites. You can even submit the asked for information on those websites. Mm -hmm. Those letters that you get in the mail have fax numbers on them, have emails on them, use them, save them, resend them. Remember, they're gonna get rid of the thorn, I promise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then just to follow up, um, I know we've already talked about processes and protocols, but it the reason why it's important to create. Do you want to know how to get a hold of us? You've got Alicia's, you've got our lovely Billy here, and a lovely Christy. Um, this is how you can get a hold of our panelists. Um, also, if you have any suggestions and feedback for future um, dinner with practice heroes topics, things that you know are giving you angst. Uh, on a daily basis within your practice. We're here for you. Let us know what that looks like, what you want us to talk about. Send a, once again, send us your suggestions, suggestions and feedback to practiceheroes at carestack.com. We have somebody else. That, I just want to make sure that I get all the chats because I don't. I'm, I'm, I'm responding right now. Oh, you are. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So next month, we talked about you're going to say like, you kind of, you guys kind of did it backwards. No, we didn't because we wanted to make sure that we're going to be, we're going to have you be proactive for 2022. Mm -hmm. Know what the game plan is for insurances. Make sure that you have tighter controls and, and better processes and protocols and hold yourself and your staff to it. We want to make sure that you collect your monies within the right time frame. right? Don't let your insurance balances and patient aging age out. For the next Dinner with Practice Heroes, that's Thursday, the 24th of February at 7 p.m. Everybody's talking about this. We're going to talk about the action steps for keeping your schedule full. Once again, we're, sh we're showing you how to collect because we're going to show you how to produce and get that revenue pumping for 2022. And once again, everybody, thank you so much for being part of our seventh series of Dinner with the Practice Heroes. We'll see you again next time. That's Thursday, February 24th, 7 p.m., Eastern Standard Time, Billy, Alicia, Christy, thanks for kicking off our uh, Dinner with Practice Heroes for the year. Have a great night. Thank you, Thank you Maria. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Bye, Tyler. Thank you for your support. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>
Bye.